Good morning, everyone. I'm Kelsey Timby from the Focus Ultrasound Foundation, and I'll be introducing our next speaker. Dr. Polio from GE Research is an expert on non-invasive peripheral nerve stimulation, and he'll be speaking with us today about Focus Ultrasound for the treatment of diabetes. Diabetes is a major health concern worldwide, with millions of patients affected and a significant risk for associated morbidities. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm going to talk about using ultrasound in a somewhat new way for uh, treating persons with type 2 diabetes, and, and by that I mean we've just got to the first steps of clinical translation of the somewhat new technology. So because of that, I'm going to um, kind of start from the beginning and tell the narrative of the initial discovery, initial preclinical work, and then get to where we are now and our results from one, one of our first clinical feasibility trials and talk about next steps. How do I uh, progress? Oh. <laughs> All right. So uh, in our early preclinical work, this kind of started five or six years ago up in upstate New York at our GE research facility with some thought experiments from myself and some of my scientific colleagues. Um, we have been doing some nerve stimulation with implants um, and uh, noticing that people were attempting to use ultrasound to stimulate peripheral nerves. Um, in the periphery, a lot of this was done where they were pointing the focused ultrasound at the nerve trunk. So this is the same spot of the nerve where people are putting on electrodes. Um, but as we read some uh, in vitro literature, uh, some early uh, brain slice work coming from William Tyler's lab, um, we noticed that the synaptic blue uh, seemed to be a little more sensitive to the ultrasound pulses compared to the nerve trunk itself. So for about 20 years, there wasn't much activity in stimulating peripheral nerves. And to us, this seemed like it could have been one of the reasons. So we started um, looking for new models where we're looking at the end organ, where the uh, synapses and the, the end terminals are actually interfacing with the, um, uh, the cells uh, themselves. So um, one other reason why we thought this might be important is because uh, implant technologies uh, are relatively dirty. They're on nerve trunks, um, some cervical, uh, vagus nerve stimulation, for instance, is, is stimulating a point in the nerve where there are 80,000 axons. So you're trying to get to that, those few axons going to a specific spot in, in an organ, um, but a lot of times you're, you're stimulating other things. So we thought that not only might um, the neuron end terminals in the nerve be a little more sensitive to ultrasound stimulation, but you also might be working towards a more precise way of doing peripheral neuromodulation, because now you're going to the end organ where the effector cells are actually communicating with those nerve terminals themselves. So in order to test what were just theories at the time, uh, we needed new models. So we had been talking to Dr. Kevin Tracy at uh, Feinstein Northwell in Long Island, and at the time, for about a decade, they were investigating this, this really novel nerve pathway. Uh, they called it the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. And it goes um, from the neck all the way down to the spleen where there are nerve terminals that synapse with immune cells in the spleen. It's mostly an effector uh, uh, side of the nervous system. There's not a lot of afferent nerves there, so it's a little bit cleaner to do some testing. And there's very well-known circuitry in there where the nerve spits out uh, norepinephrine. There are resident T cells that convert that signal to the receptors to release of acetylcholine. And then the release of acetylcholine actually changes uh, the macrophages and immune cells that are going through the spleen to the rest of the body and tamps down cytokines. One of the cytokines that this um, is designed to, um, to affect naturally is TNF-alpha. And of course, that's a very important cytokine. Anti-TNF therapies are a very large industry, um, and they're used to treat things like rheumatoid arthritis and irritable bowel disease. So now you have a very molecular drug pathway that could potentially be treated with a device through a novel uh, mechanism. So we started with preclinical models, and we took um, rats, and we would, uh, we would inflame them. We would put in some LPS, uh, some bacterial toxin, uh, and so you can see inflammation. And then we would attempt to tamp that down by activating the pathway with the ultrasound. And what we saw um, 
which we're very happy about these first few experiments, uh, as you see the norepinephrine there, so we got a dose response with ultrasound of release of norepinephrine. So indeed, the synaptic milieu seemed to be um, receptive or sensitive to these ultrasound pulses, and they were actually releasing uh, norepinephrine into the splenic environment, as we had hypothesized, which I'll talk a little more later on. Um, and that release was turning into an acetylcholine um, uh, signal as, as suspected because of this nerve pathway we understood in that spleen site. Uh, and it was shutting down TNF. And this is a pretty profound effect. So this is an animal that we've, uh, we've put in a pretty hefty dose of toxin in, and we've actually completely shut off the TNF output. Uh, so we did some more work here. Um, is this really through the nerve? What are you actually doing with the ultrasound? So very initial experiment preliminary data, but we went through and we knocked a lot of things out with, with the team, with colleagues. Um, we took mice that don't have T cells, so the effect didn't happen. We knocked out uh, the different receptors on those immune cells that are necessary to complete the circuit and it knocked the effect out. Uh, and chemically, we um, shut down the ability to release the norepinephrine from the nerves and the effect was gone. So indeed, it de did seem to be like we were acting through this cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. Um, we did lots of proof of concept mechanism, mechanism of action type of experiments. Um, this is one that we show a lot because people wanted to know, is it heating, you know, is it stretch, is it mechanical, what are you doing? We did a lot of modeling and people aren't always um, satisfied with modeling. So we actually just took a magnetic actuator, put it at the same spot, the spleen. So these pulses we're doing are shear wave pulses. Uh, they're making, uh, they're stretching the tissue uh, doing something that actually looks like elastography, which I'll get into more uh, later on. And we put a, uh, just a piston in there and we ran it at the same pulse repetition frequency as those shear waves. And indeed we got the same effect over the spleen. So more evidence that this is indeed a mechanical thing that's activating these nerves. So some first proof of concept, ultrasound mechanism of action data. Um, it's also targeted. So is it really just the spleen? You know, we moved it away to the liver. It didn't have the effect. Uh, we moved it in different spots of the spleen. The spleen is a pretty homogeneous organ. Uh, again, there's not really afferent uh, innervation there. So different spots in the spleen kind of had the same effect. Uh, we compared to the electrical stimulator because electrical vagus nerve stimulation to decrease anti-TNF is, is actually a thing. There's a company called Setpoint trying to translate that in IBD and rheumatoid arthritis. And the ultrasound stimulation had uh, a similar uh, nerve output, uh, almost the same uh, magnitude and decrease in cytokine output, uh, but didn't have some of the same side effects on cardiovascular uh, and this next one, exciting one, on metabolic function. So the vagus nerve stimulator, when you decrease inflammation, you also uh, have the side effect of decreasing hyperglycemia in that animal that we gave toxin to. So when you give a toxin to an animal, they don't just get inflamed, they also get hyperglycemic. Uh, it's a kind of a known, uh, known thing. And the vagus nerve stimulators decrease both. And that's actually a good thing, but why is it changing metabolism was our question. Um, we stimulate the spleen and our more precise ultrasound activation of the splenic pathway did not have the same metabolic effect. So now we got interested, where's that other axon that the electrical implant is stimulating that our uh, ultrasound doesn't stimulate in the spleen? So we started having thought experiments again. There are other nerve innervation points across the body which do go through the cervical vagus and the neck where that implant is sitting. Um, and we took our ultrasound and we went somewhere else in the body. So we started experimenting with neurometabolic points trying to replicate the metabolic effect in that LPS animal. And we came across a few that did it. One of them was an interesting site in the liver uh, called the porta hepatis. This is a site in the liver where the portal blood is dumping into the liver. And there are lots of sensory neurons, glucose sensory neurons. There's all these innervation in there that's telling the brain what you've eaten, how long you've eaten, and even what type of nutrients you've eaten in very unique ways. Um, and it goes up to the hypothalamus. And there's a spot in the hypothalamus, which is the central metabolic control center of the body. And so we thought here we were not having an effector effect. We weren't releasing norepinephrine into the 
liver like we were in the spleen, we were actually stimulating these sensory neurons, these afferent sensory neurons. So um, we took uh, uh, pieces of the liver, we went into the hypothalamus and collected that and did protein uh, assays. And indeed, there wasn't much changing in the liver in the spot we were stimulating, but in the hypothalamus, there were very key neurotransmitters uh, that were changing in response to ultrasound, including uh, NPY, neuropeptide Y, and POMC. And these are some of the key neurotransmitters in the hypothalamus that's controlling metabolism in the body. We did a DFMRI before and after ultrasound, and, and that hypothalamic spot, which is the key neurobiotic, neurometabolic center, uh, also um, uh, was activating in the MR. Uh, so we were excited about this. Uh, now, the LPS model might not be the most exciting animal model to, uh, to investigate these neurometabolic pathways, so we started doing the same stimulation in type 2 diabetic models. So this is a model in the blue curve there. Um, uh, there's a genetic defect in a specific receptor, and it's known to develop type 2 diabetes at a specific age. Uh, and you can see there, at day zero, at that age, we knew it would develop diabetes. And we start to get hyperglycemic, and you see that blue curve rising there. Uh, in that red curve, we're stimulating this one spot daily for about three minutes, changing that neurotransmitter uh, uh, milieu in the hypothalamus. We knew we were changing NPY in the correct way and what might be a therapeutic way. And indeed, if we stimulate it every day, we can prevent the onset of diabetes in that type 2 diabetic model with this pulse of ultrasound to the liver for three minutes. So that was pretty cool. We did the crossover experiment, the one that we weren't stimulated. We started to stimulate, and it started coming down. And we stopped stimulating the ones we were stimulated. They started going up. So this seemed to be therapeutic, but it seemed to take this, this daily stimulation activation of this uh, of this sensory pathway to the hypothalamus. It worked in multiple models, so it worked in uh, type 2 uh, diabetes models, as well as uh, uh, in that genetic model, as well as diet-induced models. And I guess, uh, is my timer correct, or is that for the original time? <laughs> Keep going, okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, so um, this portohepatic spot is an interesting spot. Um, people have known it might be therapeutic for like, I don't know, three or four decades, but there's never a good way to activate it. So to activate it, people would have to clamp this portal circulation, uh, inject in glucose, and activate these glucose sensors in a very, very invasive format. So three or four people have done it over, over decades because it's such a hard experiment. But they knew if you do activate those glucose sensors there, you have this therapeutic effect. And they kind of knew what happened. Uh, they knew that you changed liver storage of glucose into glycogen uh, temporarily, and then you activate this pathway which dumps more glucose into glycogen into the muscles. So you change the way the body is using glucose, and you're, you're storing it in the, in the muscles instead of getting this, this uh, hyperglycemic uh, uh, effect. Um, and so there's all kinds of tests that endocrinologists do, oral glucose tolerance tests, so they give the animals glucose and see what happens, and you get these, these curves there where you give them glucose, and in a diabetic model, it stays high. And then uh, if you're giving a drug, you would expect it to come low. So we started doing these drug-like tests with these ultrasound therapy, and you can see that red curve on top there shifting lower. So it's the same test people are using to test the drugs. We're now testing this potentially novel ultrasound therapy on. There's clamps that endocrinologists love to do, where you uh, clamp a specific level of insulin, and then you're pumping in glucose to maintain a specific level of glucose, and then you can investigate by giving a drug or, or doing a perturbation what happens. Um, the cool one here, we did this in a couple of different rat models and, and the pigs. In the swine experiments that we've done with our, uh, with our colleagues at Feinstein, we did ultrasound right at that dotted line. So now you have kind of a real-time outcome where you can stimulate this pathway. You have uh, the clamp, the metabolic clamp, and you can see that you're perturbing the neurometabolic system, and now all of a sudden, your glucose infusion rate to maintain that glucose clamp changes instantaneously almost when you're putting in the ultrasound. So you have this, this novel uh, kind of real-time outcome that you can see for this ultrasound therapy. And then we even put in um, electrodes in the hypothalamus. So if you really change into this nerve pathway, prove it, record from those neurons. So we did that. We put in uh, 
multi-array electrodes into the hypothalamic area. And here, we, can, we know there's glucose-sensitive neurons in that spot. So we injected glucose. That's what we're doing. And you can see, if you look at I there, you can see we've, we've got our electrode near a glucose-sensitive neuron, because we put in glucose, and the firing rate went up. And then we did ultrasound. And immediately following ultrasound, hitting this pathway, you can see that fire rate dropped. So we were indeed having a profound effect on this glucose sensing pathway with this non-invasive ultrasound pulse to the sensory neurons. Um, now people want to know molecularly what we're doing. We've kind of tackled the physical part of the mechanism of action with these and other experiments. But molecularly, what is the ultrasound doing? Uh, so we took a 3D model of neurons and culture, because now we can perturb that molecular environment a little easier. We did this with our colleagues at UCLA, um, and they had a very nice model. Uh, and we put an ultrasound at the same pulses that we were doing in, in the animals. We had a calcium imaging dye, and you can see the pulses we were putting in animals activated those neurons in the dish. Now we can put in molecular blockers for different types of ion channels to see which specific ion channel we're actually interacting with. And one of them uh, which popped out was this, this TRIP1A blocker. So trip, TRIP-A1 is one particular ion channel, and there's a specific blocker for it. And when we put that in, um, the ultrasound effect went away in the dish. We went back to our diabetes model, and the ultrasound effect went away in the animal. So now molecularly, we kind of know which specific ion channel we're interacting with. We know where that signal is going. We can record from it, and we can see which nerve pathway it's affecting. Um, so I'm going to go a little faster through the rest, uh, but this is not just one spot. Um, this ultrasound effect occurs in almost every organ we've pointed it at so far. Um, and here are three in the neuroendocrine neurometabolic pathways uh, the effect it has on the GI tract, the liver, and the pancreas. Now, depending on which nerve terminals have that TRIP-A1 molecule and what they're sitting next to. It'll do something different in every organ, but it'll have an effect, which, is, which we found pretty cool. Um, so here's that same circulating blood um, test that we did uh, in the LPS model, and we can decrease glucose three different ways, and there's three different mechanisms of action. When we're pointing at the pancreas, the neuroendocrine output is actually secretion of insulin. I told you a lot about what happens when we're pointing at the liver, and there's also sensory pathways in the gut that we can stimulate going up the hypothalamus to have a different, a different effect. So now we have gone from something that was just a cool observation to really a new way to interact with this physiological system uh, where scientists really couldn't before without doing these very invasive clamps I talked about. So now the big question is, um, does it work in people? <laughs> is it the same channel? <laughs> does the pathway go to the same spot? all the questions on clinical translation. So we've begun tackling that. We've done a few clinical trials with uh, different colleagues and different organs. I'll talk about one which we've uh, recently completed, uh, which was in, uh, it's a feasibility study in 15 persons with diabetes. Uh, they came in, um, you know, we got regulatory approval for this. We can only stimulate for three days. So you saw that in the rats. It took days of stimulation to really have the full effect. But after three days, we'd expect to see something. And we did before and after. So we had two weeks before, two weeks after, we're getting baseline measures. We're doing clamps, OGTTs, all those measures did in the rats, just to see if any of them translate. Um, we're lucky I work for GE Research, so I can work with my healthcare colleagues. We can modify the, um, uh, the device. And uh, we have this elastography imaging um, platform in our Logic E10. We can modify that pulse a little bit to do what we want still really under the FDA limits of imaging elastography and take that and ask permission to do the study, which was granted. And we can image while we're doing this. So I want to be in the port of hepatis. I know where those glucose sensors are. Uh, I can train someone to do it. I can see exactly where all the pulses are, and I can take images while they're right before they're pulsing or while they're pulsing, and then I can make sure in the right spot. So this is actual data on those 15 subjects on two trained ultrasonographers, and they were pretty good. So on the, in two there, that's all the spots that were within the bounds of our ROI or region of interest that we gave them. Uh, and there were some misses, but it's really small levels of energy. So that's below almost any uh, ultrasound imaging uh, test that is done. So it's, would be expected to be pretty benign on the off-target uh, energy. 
And the important thing here is that on several of those clinical measures, so here you see fasting insulin, day 15 was the first day of stimulation, so you have two, two pre-stimulations, day one and day 15, and then day 18 is after those three days of stimulation. So home IR, measure of insulin resistance, which changed in the rats, changed um, actually pretty significantly, even with multi-variable uh, testing performed on it. Fasting insulin went down, that's great. Um, we were limited here on the type of patient we're interacting with, so these were diabetics known to be under control. There are a lot of safety restrictions on the study. So as you can see, not many of them actually came in with really diabetic glucose levels. So that's there in the top right. Of the three that did, we decreased glucose quite a bit, um, but about two-thirds of them were really on the borderline of having normal glucose levels. In the animal models, we know that if, you have, if they have normal glucose levels, this therapy doesn't, doesn't decrease it further, which is actually a good thing. And here's some hints of it in the clinical data. Obviously, that's not enough person, people to do statistics, three people, but good promising results to begin to move on to the next steps. We did do clamps, um, and the clamp data is a lot more variable, uh, but we are expecting that GIR, GIR to change and the metabolic clearance rate of glucose to change, and there are some pretty good trends there. But with 15 people, that clamp data is a lot more variable, and again, we'll have to keep working on this, but good promising evidence that the same things we're seeing in the rats changed due to this therapy um, may be changing in the human population. The magnitude of that effect, that 20 to, uh, 20 to 30% is something you would want to see in a, in a drug when you're giving it. The magnitude is there, and that, that variability is, is, uh, is uh, I guess you're not expected to see something with only 15 patients, and we still need some work on that. But the trends are there. Um, safety is a big thing here as a first study, and there's no device-related uh, events reported, no severe event, events, no changes in vitals. So again, this is kind of an elastography image being done to the patients. We expect it to be safe, and at least initially it, it looks safe, again, allowing us to take this data and move on to the next steps in full pilots. Uh, and then really quick, that was exciting. Even more exciting now is we, we know that we have all these different spots in the neurometabolic system to stimulate. Why just stimulate the liver? Can I design an optimal study to change the hypothalamus the way I really want to in type 2 diabetics? So we did these multiple spot studies. And you can see I have two spots, a sensory pathway in the liver I talked about, and another one in the gut. Those two spots happen to change two different neurotransmitters in the hypothalamus. So we thought two is better than one, and we tried it, and it indeed looked like it was. So you can see the reduction in that animal model I talked about before is, is more in the two-spot red stimulation versus either of the single spot, gray or yellow. The reduction in the home IR, the insulin resistance test, is, is higher. It's changing two different neurotransmitters in that spot, so the pathways are doing two different things, and we can map that and learn about it. Um, and these are well-known spots, so these are, again, therapeutic spots people have been trying to get at, but how do you with a drug? You know, we're not going to stick an electrode in the middle of the brain, so how else do you get at this pathway, if not with this new non-invasive use of ultrasound? Um, and this is the cool thing. We started doing longer duration. So what happens if you stimulate longer? Because it's a new therapy, and there's all these parameters we can start to, to look at. And we actually got reduction for an increased number of days. So it's kind of like, how long is remission? Or if we stimulated for three minutes, it was about a day, had to stimulate daily. You stimulate for 15 minutes, it's longer. 30 minutes is longer. 60 minutes is longer. So what is going on here, and how long would this last? And it turned out that it lasted for a record amount of time, longer than any drug that has been applied to these, uh, to these animal models. Uh, in the ZDF model, which is a pretty bad model of type 2 diabetes, uh, it lasted for about a month. Um, so if you, we gave the drug continuously daily, even giving a drug, um, some of the best diabetes drugs, you wouldn't get that same effect in the model. And for the diet-induced animal, it just lasted the whole time. So it's now lasted for three months. We haven't gone longer. So it's putting that diet-induced animal into full remission. If you do two sites for a half hour each, um, and the cool thing is there's beginning to be a mechanism of action at that result as well. So this diabetic remission, uh, it appears to be that there's these uh, growth factors that get upregulated. They're late response genes. 
So it's known that if you stimulate um, a little bit, you get these early intermediate genes that get upregulated when you stimulate nerves. If you stimulate longer, you get late response genes. In this hypothalamic pathway, it happens to be that FGF1 is upregulated only if you stimulate long enough. It signals through a PIRC pathway, so this is a therapeutic pathway there, and that lasts for as long as uh, the remission in the animal model. The cool thing is that five years ago, someone found out, separate from us, if you inject FGF1 into the hypothalamus, you get diabetic remission. Now, um, it's going to be difficult to translate injection of something into the middle of the brain, but perhaps if this is the same mechanism and we are getting this diabetic remission, we can translate this with the ultrasound. Um, that's exactly what we're, we're up to now, finishing a few feasibility studies. Uh, just got permission with colleagues at Yale to do a feasibility study on that two-spot site. Um, work with lots of people, both internally at GE uh, and all over different universities helping us test this. Uh, so thanks to all of our colleagues. I'm a bit over, so I won't say their names, but we appreciate the help. <laughs> and thanks, everyone. A uh, quick question. It's a fascinating study. Uh, Mark Acuza at the University of Virginia has similar data about acute kidney injury with the vagus nerve stimulation. Yep. Um, I'm wondering the extent to which the type 2 diabetes studies you've had, you've investigated whether there's an immune component controlling it based around your, you know, the yep. initial observations of these um, immunosuppressors, CD4 positive T cells regulating macrophages. Yep. And then as an extension from that, whether you've considered looking at type 1 diabetes and other autoimmune diseases to understand whether this intervention can yep. mitigate those diseases. Yeah, well, I'll answer a couple different ways. Uh, one, yes, we're just at that remission uh, stage now, so we're saying, okay, it, something's got to happen in the pancreas that's long term here. We know what's happening in the hypothalamic pathway. That's signaling to the pancreas and other organs. So which one is it? We're doing pancreatic beta cell mass characterization, looking at the immune cells in there. That's all ongoing. I would guess that we're going to see a difference there, but I, I just can't say yet. But um, also, maybe it's more nerve mediated. I don't know. We're investigating that too, that you're just activating this nerve pathway that's, that's somehow therapeutic. I would guess that even that would have an immune component. Uh, but this is all new work. Um, there's um, a researcher, Dr. Otto, at um, one of the Florida universities. Sorry, I'm losing it. <laughs> but he figured out a way to do a, an electrical stimulator right in front of the pancreas, so get precision a different way. And he's doing that in type 1 diabetics uh, models and actually seeing uh, regeneration of pancreatic cells. So I, I think, yeah, but all new. The second part was, have you looked at other autoimmune diseases to see whether this pulsed ultrasound rule, is it globally immunosuppressive or? Uh, it, right now, it seems to be associated with particular immune pathways, uh, neuroimmune pathways, like CAP or like the one going to the pancreas. Uh, so the mechanism of action is nerve mediated. It would depend on where you're pointing and what you're trying to do. Um, but, you know, is it doing something to resonant immune cells too, you know, maybe, I, I can't say, we haven't tested for it. Yeah. Beautiful work. Thanks. So my question would be, it seems that A one is the channel which you can mechanically massage to stimulate the nerve cells. Uh, did you try different patterns to see whether you can create like a different release or these, you know, uh, stimulation or the maybe the neurotransmitter for the you know, benefit of the body? In some of our publications, we have uh, lots of parameter space exploration. If you go, go back and look, there's a pretty big plateau on, on power, pretty big plateau on pulse repetition frequency, broader than we expected when you're doing these, this parameter space search where you're having the same effect. Um, you know, you go too low, you're not having the effect. You go too high, you're doing damage, but in the middle, appear to be having the same effect so far. Um, I would say trip A1 is not going to be the only ion channel that's involved with this. Um, there's researchers at Columbia Kanafagu Lab who are doing it on nerves that innervate the skin. There's a different set of ion channels that are responsive to ultrasound there. Um, Dr. Sh uh, Mikhail Shapiro at Caltech and the Kelasani Lab at um, um, 
somewhere in California, losing me, <laughs> losing me, losing Salk me again. Salk, Salk Institute. Institute. Yeah, they've actually put trip A1 into other cells and made them responsive to ultrasound. So there's a lot of work that there's going to be a class of the ion channels that are responsive, but it's not just going to be one. It happens to be that one in our spot. Beautiful work. Congratulations. Thank you. Very nice, beautiful work. Um, question is, because we've done similar things in IBD in a mouse model and showed suppression of basically the inflammatory component in, in the bowel, but we did it with low food. And is there a real requirement to do high foo in this when you can get a reasonably sized transducer? To see? And since you could be off target, but if you're below the mechanical index of for the liver or any other organ in the body, could you actually do this without doing the focusing? Um, so I guess, actually, I didn't talk much about the parameter space, which I should have, because I'm an ultrasound <laughs> conference. But we're, we're actually not, I wouldn't consider us high foo, so we're, you know, we're, we're kind of down there with you guys. But again, there's this broad, broad parameter space that seems to be having the same effect. So. Right, so like this could actually do this with a flat. You don't need a basically a transducer, a focused ultrasound transducer. You could do it with a, basically a planar transducer and just place yeah. it over the liver. And yes, you're exciting other areas, but you could be hitting this target directly. I think that precision you talked about is the key. So in the liver, right next to that aportive pattus, there's other things that affect metabolism. So in the liver, I'd probably want to be precise. I'd want to do the imaging and even going to the FDA and asking for permission to do this, I'd want to be able to tell them I know where I'm hitting and right. I know I'm hitting there every time. Right. In the spleen, it's been the opposite. You yeah. touch the spleen with ultrasound anywhere on the spleen and it seems to have a similar effect. There's a couple pathways there, but they're really doing the same thing. And you can actually see, because ultimately you can ultimately see something where people wear this, essentially, and just go yeah. ahead and, and live yep. all, you know, all day long with, essentially, a few pulses, especially with inflammatory bowel disease. Yep. Down there, like, the symptoms. There's a company called Second Wave coming out of Hubert Lim Lab in uh, University of Minnesota, and they're making what might be considered a wearable. It's got a box, mm -hmm. but it's got a flat transducer yep. to go over the spleen. Yep. 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 Thank you again for that absolutely fascinating talk. Um, we do need to move on to our next speaker. Thank you.